looking at the reasons for believing in God. And last time we talked about internal reasons. So remember before that we talked about um, this uh, consensus gentium or this idea of the, the, the agreement of the people. How there is a, a, a sense among most people of every age and culture, background, economic status, what, uh, gender, age, whatever, that there is a God who exists. And so there is this uh, sense that um, everyone has that there is a, a God. Now, uh, they have different ideas about God, who He is and what He is like. And so there are all different kinds of religions around the world. But uh, throughout the world in general, you find that there is a sense that there is a higher, you know, as some would describe it, a higher power or supreme being, something to that effect. And so uh, we noted that as... Uh, one form of evidence for the existence of God, but clearly it's not uh, complete evidence because uh, just because uh, um, the majority of people might hold some idea or thought doesn't mean that they are right. Um, I've seen this in many different elections where I disagreed with the majority opinion about who should be president, vice president, what have you, governor. Um, doesn't mean the, ma the majority is right all the time. So we want to hold those kind of arguments with a little bit of, um, with a take them with a grain of salt, let's put it that way, and uh, be careful about that. But uh, what Oliphant did was he took that and said, okay, there's something deeper going on here. And he referred to Calvin and his institutes where he argues for uh, what he calls the sense of deity, sensus deitus whereby all mankind has written on their hearts a deep impression that God exists, that they know the true God and not the various religions that they profess. They have deep within them a knowledge of the true God and something of his nature, and they know that they are accountable to him. So it is this revelation of God uh, that is impressed upon the human heart that makes it such that all mankind, even the atheist, knows deep down within that there is a God and they are accountable to him. And in fact, any of the arguments that the, the, the atheist or the, um, the pagan who has a different religion, uh, any of the arguments that they might make use of in defense of their position really depend upon the truth of Christian faith, the truth of the God of the Bible, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they borrow from the, the basic truths of these things in order to support their own arguments. So there will be a place where they are inconsistent with their own ideas. And if you can show that inconsistency, you'll begin to cause their particular point of view to break down, at least intellectually. Uh, that doesn't mean that they will repent of their worldview. Uh, their heart, remember, is corrupted by their sin. They are naturally hostile to God. They will suppress the knowledge of God at all costs, so no matter what it takes, they are suppressing that information. Um, but God himself has revealed himself to them deep within their hearts. It is an infallible knowledge because God himself has revealed it to them. Again, they suppress it, they hide it, they cover it up with all different kinds of philosophies, ideas, immoral living, all these kinds of things. And, and their consciences can become seared and hardened. Uh, but deep down within, they know that there is a God. I think that it's one of the great Roman emperors, and I'm forgetting the name. Maybe it was Titian, uh, or, or I'm not sure. Maybe Rick can uh, recall this, but uh, he was uh, very much Julian, Julian the Apostate. He, he was very mm. much hostile to the, the Christian God. And he fought against him, tried to suppress all uh, knowledge of God in his realm and persecuted the church uh, greatly. But on his deathbed, he said something to the effect, You have won, O Galilean. Uh, you are the victor, O Galilean, speaking about Jesus. He finally acknowledged that Jesus conquered him. And so deep within the heart of even the most intense persecutor of the church, there is a knowledge that God exists and that they are accountable to him in the end.
Julian the Apostate, I believe was his name, and you can perhaps mm -hmm. look that up and check that out. So, uh, there are internal reasons then for why we believe in God, because God has placed that information within us. And uh, that's why we say that all men are accountable to God and they will perish in their sins. Um, even if they've never heard of the gospel, they nonetheless are accountable to God and will suffer the punishment for their sins, uh, for their idolatry and their immorality, uh, with e an eternal judgment. So this is why we go out into all the world preaching the gospel so that some at least might be saved. They might be rescued from the judgment that is to come. So um, we, we, we don't believe in a universal salvation such that all men are naturally okay and some might uh, be saved by living a good life even if they never hear the gospel and God will somehow accept what they do and say well that's good enough uh, no their hearts are in rebellion against the true God everything within them and indeed everything around in the world around them speaks of this true God and their refusal to worship and serve him to give thanks to him is uh, uh, one sign of God's judgment upon them and they will ultimately be condemned. So, um, those are internal reasons that God has placed within our own nature. There are also external reasons, which now Dr. Oliphant will uh, develop for us. And these come in the form of what has been classically called the cosmological argument. Uh, that's an argument from, it could be an argument from design, uh, it's an argument from cause and effect relationships, so we'll, we'll develop that for you here in just a little bit. Um, there, there's a long history to this use of the cosmological argument, and from a Reformed perspective, uh, I think Oliphant will probably say some things about this. Um, we do recognize that there's validity to the argument, but certainly we don't depend upon them ultimately for uh, the defense of the Christian faith. Uh, we depend upon the Word of God and all that God has had to say. But uh, these arguments will tend to strengthen your faith and protect you against the attacks of the evil one, and I hope that they'll be helpful for you as we go through them a little bit this morning. So let me pick up our reading, and uh, if you have your book in front of you, uh, let me see, what page are we on? Page 41 is what I have. Uh, page 41. So I'll begin reading from there. The reason we have placed quotation marks around internal reasons and external reasons in this section is because we are making a distinction between two things that actually belong together. God's revelation in and through creation is always and everywhere both internal and external. They are so tightly connected that it is impossible to separate them. In other words, God has revealed himself in our nature, within, our mind, our, our soul, our emotions, our will. Uh, all these things reveal God to us. And then the world external to us also reveals God to us. And furthermore, there is a connection between the two. The two interact and support, mutually enforce each other. So I am able to understand the world around me and able to understand what it has to say to me about God. And so uh, there's external and internal reasons, but they work together in tandem, in harmony, to support the same revelation of God in, in nature, what we might call general revelation. And we'll continue here. Uh, the distinction is helpful in that, as we discussed in the previous section, the internal aspect of God's revelation helps us to see the agreement of the people argument for what it is. It is a testimony to the fact that all people do internally know the true God, but in rebellion seek to suppress it. That suppression creates idolatry. We will believe in a God, an image that we will worship and serve, but we will not acknowledge the true God. So you see how that works. God reveals himself to our hearts, because, but because our hearts are in rebellion against God, we construct something else to take the place of this God. 
And so we have false philosophies, false religions, uh, false moral systems, and we flatter ourselves in thinking that these are the true things and we worship them. All the while knowing deep within our hearts that this is all false. <laughs> it's all a, a facade and it, it, it cannot stand. And so uh, what, what the natural man does is suppress the truth within him, hide it, cover it up by constructing, constructing all these false uh, images and ideas and so forth. Oliphant says, in the same way when we think of the external reasons for believing in God, we are thinking not specifically about what God is implanting, to use Calvin's word, in us, but what God is showing us externally through the world that we experience every day. So, uh, we're talking about those things which are external to us. This too is what Paul has in mind in Romans 1, verses 18 through chapter 2, verse 23, Paul is, or excuse me, God is making himself known from what has been made. He is pointing us to ourselves, internal, but also to the world around us, external. God's revelation is in all of creation, inside of us and outside of us. That revelation gives a certain strength to some of the so-called proofs for God's existence. And I was going to talk about one of them in a moment. Uh, one of the things that we often talk about is the argument from design. You look at the world and see how complex it is and you think, well, a world so complex as to have human beings as incredibly complex as we are. You know, you think of how medical science has advanced, but still there are so many things that science doesn't understand about the human body. And uh, so there's uh, an incredible design that goes into a human being and then there's a design as well all around us and that points to a designer someone who formed and fashioned all these things um, so the world around us points us to the existence of God uh, he's going to talk about a, a similar argument here and we'll pick up his argument now for example, one of the more popular arguments for God's existence is the argument from cause and effect, often called the cosmological argument. There are variations of this argument, but the substance of it goes something like this. Everything that comes to be has a cause. The universe came to be, therefore God caused the universe. An argument like this is patently obvious to any Christian. It has compelling force to Christians because we recognize the biblical truth that it communicates. Now, we are informed by Scripture. We read the first verses of the Bible which says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so when we receive the Word of God, we recognize that God's existence precedes the existence of the world. And there's no argument for the existence of God. He always was. But the world comes into existence at a particular point in time because God speaks and all things come into being. And so what you have is God as the uncaused cause. That is to say, God himself does not have some being behind him that's creating him and causing him to exist. No, he always has existed. And so there's no cause to God. He is an uncaused cause or causer. <laughs> and so God is the one who has caused the universe to exist. And so you have this, uh, if you will, a full stop to the argument that says, well, uh, this was caused by this, and this was caused by that, and this was caused by that. And you go back and back into time until you get to this final spot and you say, okay, well, what caused the origin of life? For example, well, there was nothing prior to the origin of life except for God, and God brought it into existence. So, uh, the argument from cause and effect uh, is one that Christians who accept the Bible are ready to recognize as having authority. But all thing continues, but what about someone who is not a Christian? What might an atheist, for example, think about this argument. 
We don't have to guess on an answer. The famous British atheist Bertrand Russell, in an essay titled Why I Am Not a Christian, said this about the first cause or cosmological argument. This is a quote from Russell. I may say that when I was a young man and was debating these questions very seriously in my mind, I for a long time accepted the argument of the first cause. Until one day at the age of 18, I read John Stuart Mill's autobiography, and I there found this sentence. My father taught me that the question, who made me, cannot be answered, since it immediately suggests the further question, who made God? That very simple sentence showed me, as I still think, the fallacy of the argument of the first cause. If everything must have a cause, then God must have a cause. If there can be anything without a cause, it may just as well be the world as God, so that there cannot be any validity in that argument. Okay, do you see what he's saying here? He's saying that every effect has its cause. And so you go back in time and say, well, the world had a cause, something that brought it into existence. What was that cause? Well, Christians say it's God. Okay, well, continue the argument further. What caused God? If everything that ha is an effect has a cause, then what caused God? What was prior to God? And then what was prior to that? And what was prior to that? You can go on ad infinitum. And so this is the argument that uh, John Stuart Mill's father raised for him and was persuasive to an 18-year-old Bertrand Russell. Now, one thing that one might suggest is that the nature of God is such that it is not an effect dependent upon a cause. God always exists. Um, he is eternal. And so there can be, cannot be a temporal cause to that which is eternal. And so his understanding of God was corrupted. He humanized God and made him something like ourselves. And then after doing that, he basically says, okay, since uh, this argument doesn't hold for God because God must have a cause, then we can dismiss the whole idea of God as a cause, just do away with that and say, we'll just start with the world. The world created itself. Now, he doesn't get to argue or think through that either because... Uh, that is problematic as well. To say that the world is its own cause is ra rather uh, quite an amazing statement. Uh, after all, uh, something doesn't come from nothing. Nothing doesn't create everything. There must be something there before it. So uh, you're, uh, if you're going to say that the world created itself or caused itself, then it must be eternal. And clearly the world is not eternal. The world has its own temporal issues. It is subject to time, to decay, to corruption, and so forth. And so the sense that the world is eternal is really uh, argued against by the world itself. It's not eternal, it's temporal. And so therefore, this argument that the world can be its own cause falls apart. Uh, because something doesn't come from nothing. And secondly... If you're going to say that the world is its own cause, then the world must be eternal. And I might develop that a little bit further by saying um, the eternal cannot be produced by the temporal. Time cannot produce eternity. It must be eternity producing time. Now, I may be getting a little bit too far into the weeds here, but um, the, the, if the cause must be greater than the effect. Let, let me illustrate that. If I, I've been watching these programs on uh, Motor Trend TV about these guys who go out in auto mechanics and they find these old cars, old sports cars, old classics, old jalopies, whatever. And they come in and the owner wants to soup them up again. And so they come in and they pull them into the shop and they're tearing them all down, uh, stripping the parts, stripping the rust off, uh, refabricating stuff putting it all together again and coming up with a, a, a pretty amazing uh, uh, approximation to what it was originally. Indeed, in some cases, it's better than what it was originally. Um, well, what brought that all about? 
the car couldn't do it to itself. It was just going to rust away. It needed something greater than itself in order to produce that change. What was that? Well, it was the mechanics, the humans who came into the equation and made the change. So the cause is greater than the effect. Now, if the effect is the world, the cause cannot be the world because the cause is not sufficient to create that effect. You need an eternal God, all-wise, all-powerful, um, all-loving, personal God to create the world in which we now live. And apart from that assumption, you cannot explain what we have in the world today. Otherwise, cars can repair themselves and pigs can fly. So, um, I haven't seen pigs fly lately, so I think I'm safe in suggesting that. <laughs> so we'll continue here. nothing dies. I'm sorry? Nothing. The flowers wouldn't die. Right, yeah. Animals shouldn't die. Yeah. Yeah, they should regenerate themselves. But they can't because they're subject to decay and God placed them in that position. Okay, so Oliphant continues, Russell recognized that the notion that everything must have a cause included God. If one wanted to argue that God was not caused, why not just believe that the universe was not caused? In some ways we can see the problem in Russell's analysis of this argument. We could say to him something like, but Lord Russell, don't you see? The very idea of God includes someone who could not be caused by anything. It is not that everything has a cause, but that every effect has a cause. God is no effect. To which Russell would likely reply, first you tell me that everything that comes to be has a cause, and then you tell me that God is not caused. I see that you believe that. The problem is, is that idea of an uncaused God which I do not believe. I am quite happy to have cause and effect in everything. I don't need an uncaused cause. Okay. It should be encouraging to us to recognize that when such arguments are given, they have a very strong appeal. They have an almost overwhelming appeal because the knowledge of God within us is connected to the revelation of God outside of us. The universe has a cause. The cause of all things is God, Genesis 1, verse 1. To say so is to affirm what God himself is revealing in all of creation. Uh, I think I mentioned this before. I might have mentioned this before. There was a movie put out by Ben Stein a number of years ago. I think the title of it was Expelled. Uh, but it was talking about the uh, way that public school system is hostile to uh, the idea of creationism. And mind you, Ben Stein is a Jewish man, not a Christian man. But he recognized that there is a creator. And so he went and he interviewed uh, Richard Dawkins, the famed atheist that we talked about some time ago, and asked him about the origins of life. And uh, uh, ben Stein would get him to, to argue from one point to one point and get all the way back to the very beginning of things and then um, uh, Dawkins said, well, well life originates in, in a pond where a spark comes in or something and, and life comes up. Well, where did this spark come from? Where did this seed of life come from? And then he says, well, some uh, outer space uh, life form comes into the world and, and places the seed of life into this world. And that's where it begins. And so he, he's just moving the, the, the goalpost back further and further and further uh, until finally it gets to the point of absurdity in arguing that, well, there was some foreign intelligence off on a distant planet that came and planted a seed of life on the world and allowed it to germinate over millions and millions of years. Well, I hope you see that the atheist really does not have a compelling argument for their position and it really ends up in, in a, a place of irrationality because the next thing you could say is well where did this uh, 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 interplanetary source of life come from? Uh, where, where did the Martians life come from? Where did the, the, 
the, the Klingon's life come from, and the, the Romulan and all the rest of it, you know, all these different uh, uh, life forms out in the rest of the universe. Where did they originate? And ultimately, he's got nothing to say. Um, there must be a God behind all of this. Okay, so Russell and all others who are in rebellion against God work tirelessly to suppress what is obvious in the world. For him, believing in an uncaused universe is all he needs. He doesn't need an uncaused God. He will believe in an uncaused universe not because the cosmological argument is bad in itself, but because he knows that to agree to the conclusion of the argument would require him to repent, to honor God, and to give him thanks. As a rebel against God, he will twist the argument. If he didn't, it would require him to ask how he can be forgiven by the God he has offended. But his rebellion will run away from such a requirement, and the sin will push with all its might to avoid admitting such a thing. So if you go back to what Bertrand Russell said, which uh, was basically, I'm quite happy to have a cause and effect in everything, I just don't need an uncaused cause. Um, and so he's saying, well, I don't believe that uh, God is an uncaused cause, he's a, an effect with a cause. Well, he, he never really answers the Christian position that God is not an effect, he is ever existent, he is eternal. There is no cause to God. He always was. He doesn't have an answer to that. But rather than believing in that and recognizing that this really truly does explain everything in the world around him, he says, I'm just simply going to reject that, continue to suppress it under my false idea that God is an effect with a cause and therefore the whole thing can be dismissed and I can just simply trust myself to the universe with this cause and effect relationships. Uh, he, he, he shows his inner heart of rebellion in the way that he formulates his argument. He will not submit to the truth of Scripture. He will undermine it, subvert it, uh, shift it, the terms, push it aside, and just simply go on his own way. And you'll find that happens time and time again when you're arguing with somebody. Uh, they cannot deal with the truth of the Christian claim of an a God who is eternal in his existence, who is infinite, who is personal, who is uh, uh, all-knowing, all-powerful, and so forth. That's something they cannot accept because, as Dr. Oliphant points out, then they are accountable to this God, and the consequences to that are just enormous for them, and they're unwilling to, to accept that. And so the heart rebels against it. Okay, continuing. Other external arguments for belief in God have been pursued. The fact that our existence is limited and dependent means something must exist with unlimited and independent existence. The intricate design of the universe and its smallest components as well as the billions of galaxies requires someone bigger who designed it, who designed it all. Quote, you wouldn't come across a watch in a desert, end quote. So the argument goes without recognizing that such a complex and well-designed device must have been designed by an intelligent and skilled person. That's the argument of, from design, uh, a classic argument. Uh, I'm trying to think of the author of that argument at the moment, and the name is escaping me. I thought it was Wittgenstein, but I, I, I don't think that's correct. In any case, you have... The, the watch sitting out there in the wilderness and it's ticking along and you come up and take a look at it and you find how intricately this Swiss watch, watch is. You see all the movements of the gears and so forth and you say, well, how did this come to pass? Well, it just didn't appear there in the desert. Somebody designed it. We all accept that. We all expect that. And so if there is something complex, there must be a designer who is even more complex and that is God. That's the argument from design. All of this external evidence of God's existence does indeed testify of his existence. Each and every one of them reveals that God exists and is who he says he is. These are not facts in the world that are simply there for us to interpret as we wish. They are first and foremost God's facts 
as he reveals himself through each one. To put them out as evidence of God's existence is to point to what ought to be obvious to everyone. But sin clouds, distorts, and hides the obvious. It blinds us, renders us deaf, and makes us like corpses when it comes to the things of God. How then can we ask the blind to see, the deaf to hear, and corpses come to life? That is the critical question. When you think of the nature of man and how he sees everything all around him, as pointing to God, even everything within him, the very way that he is made, the very way that he is able to think, all of that speaks of the one true God, and yet he rejects it all, refuses to accept it, and composes other kinds of belief systems. What is it that's going to change his heart and mind? Clearly, he doesn't have it within himself to make that change. His heart is committed against the revelation that is all within him and around him. He is dead set against that at all costs. And so therefore we must look to a sovereign work of God to change his heart, to humble him, and to show him the mercies and grace of God, God's readiness to forgive. Yeah. But Chuck's point is well made. It really is that man will not believe. His, his will is bound. And as Luther wrote his book, Bondage of the Will, you can point out to someone like Bertrand Russell or Richard Dawkins the infallacy or fallacies of their position, and the, at the most they'll probably say, "Well, I don't believe it. <laughs> I just don't believe it." <laughs> I, you know, so, and that's what the really, that's the whole point is they they will not. You can hit them over the head with a baseball bat, and they would still say. You didn't hit me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah that, that's why we talk about the, the, the sovereignty of God's grace, the inward work of the Holy Spirit, the illumination of the heart and mind so that we can see the truths of God's Word and have a heart softened and changed such that we are willing to oh. respond. Uh, that's all the work of God's grace and that all occurs secretly within us as God's Word comes to us through the Gospel of Christ and uh, causes rebels to become disciples and uh, causes the dead to come alive. So uh, it, it's uh, all of God's grace and not the result of works, not the result of anything that we have done. Okay, we're in this section for digging deeper. Now I just finished the first paragraph. It's, it won't do to talk to people about a designer, an uncaused cause, or one whose existence is necessary. Uh, Elephant says, those statements are true enough, but they don't always get to the heart of the problem. For example, let's take Russell's objection, second paragraph there. Russell says, in effect, if there needs to be anything without a cause, it may just as well be the world rather than God. If we think carefully about what Russell is saying here, we can get closer to his real reason for rejecting God. How could it be, we would ask, that if we're looking for an uncaused cause, the world is as good a candidate as God? Or on what basis can Russell believe that the world is uncaused? How would he go about arguing for that belief? Okay, now, so we're going to put Russell on the defensive here and make him account for his arguments. And uh, the, the pagan doesn't always appreciate that when their position is turned around. They've got to account for things uh, that they argue for. So here we read, Russell holds that we should believe only what can be established by evidence. What evidence is there that the world is uncaused? <laughs> Good question. Try to prove that. Were you there at the beginning when the world was uncaused? <laughs> Obviously, it, it won't work. He would himself, he would find himself in a difficult spot trying to answer that question. Science has not discovered anything that is uncaused. Everything we know about the world, to the extent that we can know it, depends on other aspects of the world in order to be what it is. Russell could not point to one thing in the world that is not caused by anything at all. I remember years ago when I was 
a boy preacher, if you will, <laughs> uh, preaching at my home church at Maple Glen. I was probably in high school, uh, maybe in first year or two of college. In any case, um, I used as an illustration um, your breakfast in the morning uh, in arguing for the existence of God and also of the fly on your window. Uh, has anyone built something as amazing as a fly? It's a very simple organism, very simple being, but who has made a fly uh, like a fly? Who's pr pr created life like a fly? Now, if we can't make a fly, how are we going to make other things it is, uh, in terms of living things? And then that's going from an uncaused to a cause, to an effect. And then with your breakfast, when was the last time you came downstairs and there your breakfast was already cooked waiting for you? <laughs> It does, just doesn't happen. You know, the bacon and the eggs and the coffee and the, the orange juice, whatever. Somebody's got to put all that together. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so the world is composed of causes, and there's no evidence of anything that is just uncaused out of the blue. There's always something behind it. Oliphant continues, Why well, think that an uncaused world is as good an answer as an uncaused God? The answer is obvious. Russell has decided that it is better to have faith, a blind faith, that the world is uncaused than to believe that God caused it. There is no evidence that shows the world to be uncaused, but Russell is going to believe it, regardless of his lack of evidence or support. This is the very definition of blind faith. Now, Russell himself will argue for, as Oliphant mentioned, that there's got to be evidence. You've got to use a scientific method. There's got to be experiments. There's got to be some analysis of things to show and to prove. Well, okay, turn it around. Put your own system into place. What evidence is there for an uncaused cause of the universe? In terms of the universe being that uncaused cause, there's just no support for that. So Russell is willing to abandon all of his professed belief in arguments and reason and, and evidence uh, and just commit himself to something which is foolish so that he can avoid the more reasonable uh, belief, a revelation that God himself has caused all things. Um, it's just as Tamar was saying a moment ago, quoting scripture, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's not just intellectual foolish, foolishness, it's moral foolishness because there are consequences to that unbelief, uh, judgment itself. Uh, continuing, so uh, I would say, continuing with that, Russell is culpable for his ignorance. Russell is responsible for uh, his denial of the existence of God. The evidence is there right before him, but he's just unwilling to accept it. He just wants to dismiss it. And he'll be accountable for that when he stands before God, his creator. Continuing, the atheist Thomas Nagel, in contrast to Russell, is much more honest about his atheism. Instead of pretending that he is being thoroughly scientific in his atheism, Nagel says, quote, I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and, naturally, hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. My guess is that this cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition and that it is responsible for much of the scientism and reductionism of our time. One of the tendencies it supports is the ludicrous overuse of evolutionary biology to explain everything about human life, including everything about the human mind. This is a somewhat ridiculous situation. <laughs> That's quite a statement from an atheist. Uh, applaud him for his honesty in saying, I just don't want it to be that way. Um, I, I recently was engaged in an argument on uh, a statement by Governor, Tom, Governor um, uh, 
Wolf, the governor of Pennsylvania, where he uh, criticized the Republican Congress for trying to pass laws that would outlaw abortion in the state of Pennsylvania. And he said he was going to support a woman's right to choose. And he went on in those terms. Well, uh, and it said you know, something like, well, the woman has the right to her own body and all this sort of thing. She has the right to choose. So I started writing on that and uh, arguing that the child, first of all, is not the woman's body. It's a separate body within the woman. It has different DNA, genetic code, fingerprint. Uh, you can scan the iris. It'll be different. Uh, brain waves different, blood type different, body different, maybe a, a, a male gender within the female body. I mean, all these things speak to the fact that this is a different body. This is not the woman's body, just not part of the woman's body. It's within the woman's body, to be sure, and dependent upon the woman's body, but it is a separate life growing within the woman. And so it's not just the woman's choice that's involved here, it's this child's choice. And you could even say, doesn't the man who fathered the child have any say in the matter as well? Uh, because there would be no child there without the man's input as well. But regardless of that side of things, the child clearly is an independent life within the life of the mother. And one, one woman said, it's unfair of God to uh, uh, have uh, a child be produced by sex. We ought to be able to have sex without having to produce a child. And so I thought, this is crazy. God made us in such a way that when we have sex, we have pleasure along with that. And the woman wants to separate the two and just have baby making over here like you drop a quarter into the, the gum machine and now comes a, 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 out pops a baby child. And on the other hand, you're going to have your sex as much as you want, whenever you want it, as long as you want it. You know, It's like people are living in, in a, a strange world. They're not accepting the world that God has made. They want it differently. And that's what this writer is doing here, uh, Nagel. Um, I don't want there to be a God. I hope there's not a God. I don't believe in that kind of a system. So he, he's admitting the fact that he's hostile to the whole idea of the of the God of Christianity who has revealed himself in the Bible itself. And not only, you might say, is he to be commended at least for being honest about that, but also when he talks about how the evolutionary scientist talks about evolution in, de in defense of the origins of man, when clearly and obviously evolution cannot really define or explain human existence. Um, material interactions and, and Mutations cannot produce intellect, reasoning, love, compassion, joy, all these kinds of things. That's beyond the material realm. And so the atheist or the, the scientist who resorts to these kinds of things is engaging in a ridiculous argument. And at least Nagel is honest enough to admit that the argument is ridiculous. It does not solve the problem. So that points us again to the rebellion of the human heart, where Nagel says, I recognize the problem, but I don't like the solution, and so therefore I'll just simply reject it and stay within my own confused state of mind. So Oliphant continues, Russell's problem with the cause-effect argument is that he blindly chooses to end the argument with an unsupported belief in an uncaused universe. He does this not because it is more scientific or more rational. He does it because, like Nagel, he does not want there to be a God. That's it. Bottom line. He doesn't like the consequences, particularly the true God who has revealed himself to his heart. He's not happy with that, and so he must reject it at all costs, even at the cost of his own rationality and morality. Finally, this is what Paul means by suppression of the truth. God caused the universe. Russell knows this because he knows God, and all who deny it know it too. But the knowledge God gives them is continually held down. They will never admit the truth of it until their wills are changed. Instead, they will interpret the words in a way that will produce a blind faith conclusion. 
The problem with Russell and with any who choose to hold down the truth is not that the external and internal evidence is insufficient for them to believe in God. The problem, as Nagel says, is that they do not want there to be a God. I think that's a devastating argument for the, the atheist and their position. Uh, in the end, they recognize that their arguments don't hold up, but they would rather have these arguments that don't hold up than submit to the true God who has revealed, themselves, revealed himself to them in every aspect of life. Okay, I'll pause for a moment and see if you have any thoughts or comments on that. And I think we'll have to leave the balance to another time. Yeah. It's the same kind of thing where the evidence is very plain to them, but they just simply will reject it. It's like they, they have blinders on, they don't want to hear it. Because the consequences of hearing the information for that... Oh, am I muted? No, I'm okay. Right. No, you're not. Okay. You're not. The consequences for uh, recognizing that this, this is a real child dwelling within them and uh, they're accountable for that life uh, it, it's just beyond what they're willing to accept. And for many of them, you know, like the arguments that I was coming across there under Governor Wolf's uh, post, they, they wanted sex without consequences. <laughs> they, they didn't want any, any consequences to what they were doing. So. They wanted basically to do whatever they wanted to do and not have anything come of it, you know. And that's just not the world in which we live. Not, not simply with regard to sex and our relations, you know, in that way, but everything in life, everything you do has a consequence. There's responsibility and accountability for everything that you do. And to try to dismiss consequences is just to put yourself in um, a fairy tale kind of world. But uh, people would rather do that than face reality, face the truth, which includes you know, having to face God. The same about transgender. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, but you can put it in any sinful, anything that's sinful, people love their sin more than they love, yeah. than, than they love what's righteous and good. So that's where we're, we, in a certain sense, when we argue with people, and even present logical or go godly arguments, we have to remember that person is blind and deaf and dumb <laughs> uh, because of sin in their heart, and uh, it'll take the work of the Spirit to change them. Think of the homosexual argument. I mean, clearly there is patently obvious, biologically obvious, that a male is made for a female and, and vice versa and it's not designed otherwise and yet they want to do away with what is obvious and do what suits their desires. So in rebellion to the way God has made the world, they want to do what they want to do. So they want to have sex without consequences and sex wherever they can find it without consequences. And they're just separating themselves from the real world in which God has made and living in rebellion. So it's the homosexual, it's the, the transgender movement, uh, it's the abortion rights movement, just all kinds of things. The, the socialist system is the same. It's just like we can redistribute money without consequences. We, we can print money without consequences. Well, there are consequences. It'll catch up to you. It might take a while, but eventually, uh, as what Maggie Thatcher said, you eventually run out of other people's money. <laughs> there, there are limits to things that you can do. So, God, you can jump up in the air and defeat gravity for, you know, as me, it's not quite as high as it used to be. <laughs> but you're going to come <laughs> down. <laughs> one, of, one of the identities now that the woke culture was it, there is, a, is a baby producer. So, like, a, a, was it instead of a wife or a mother or something, they're, they're called baby producers now. Yeah, really. <laughs> oh, <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> It's like something out of 1984, you know, in double speak, you know. Obviously, it's a mother, but a baby producer, you know, it's just like because they want to uh, dis, dis, disassociate it with sex and all this other stuff. There's there's so much going on gender. there that's simple. Yeah, they want to avoid gender, so that the mm -hmm. homosexual can flatter themselves into thinking that well. 
you know, something can happen there where the transgender person can flatter themselves and think, well, I can become a woman and carry a child, as it were. But it is, it is true about like about the blindness. Unless touched by the Holy Spirit, they just they're not going to see this. And and, 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 right. and like like, uh, like Rick said, we would all be like burnt mushrooms if we didn't have the uh, yeah. If we weren't touched by the Holy Spirit, it, it makes that makes a lot yeah. of sense to yeah. me. So. Yeah, that's a humbling thing to have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It's it's it's, it's good to know. I, I think it's frightening that. This uh, whole homosexual everything, all this stuff is becoming so prevalent that they're trying to push the Christian moralities right out the window. And, and, and are we able to push back? I mean, can we can we push back and tell them, hey, this is a mistake. You're not following God. How can we do that? I, I mean, do we ha how can we have enough force to do that? Well, you raise an excellent question. When you look at our culture, uh, I think this past election makes it abundantly, patently obvious that there are forces at work in our culture today that are hostile to Christianity, Christian faith, and are seeking to destroy it effectively. And they have their hands on the levers of power throughout the culture, the media, education, uh, entertainment, news, everything you look is controlled by this secular, atheistic hostile point of view so can we change it well we have a couple of things going for us one is that there are a lot of people that believe the way we do and that th these who are in control of the levers of power are not I think not in the majority although there's a lot of them and they are in these positions of power which make it very difficult to to, to fight against them but you know I my feeling is that Trump won in the past election by a, a, a landslide, by a significant margin. Proving that is another matter, and it will come, maybe that will, that may never even come to light, but I suspect that there are a lot of people at least who hold to the views that you and I would share. Um, so we have to work, we have to pray, we have to do what we can and leave the consequences in God's hands. It may be that our culture is going to descend into a darkness and irrelevance and really a nightmarish future uh, where a pagan state comes into control just like you have in China. And we may have, and, and I think you know, more realistically so, we may have a, a very dark future ahead of us um, with tremendous persecution for Christians uh, unfolding. But, um, we can still fight and, and got to do what we can. Um, but the Lord is greater than he who is in the world. Right. And, That's right. Um, so we have all that we need to overcome. We don't need to be fearful of it. It sounds like the consequences of the gender movement though are coming. They're, they're starting to see some of the negative consequences because of all the suicides and also now these young kids that trans, trans, transform themselves Transformers, yeah. and, and then you know they a few years later they be, they grow up they become a young adults and they realize it's, it didn't help and they're trying to transform back there's so, there's, yeah. so there's a little bit of that happen, uh, more of that happening I think now uh, the, the doctors some of them are getting sued now yeah. But, yeah. Maybe not enough, but there's a lot going on out there. The problem is that you have the uh, media that clamps down on that information, sure, and yeah. you have you know, many attempts to silence anyone who would speak against that sort of thing. And whether it's in the business environment, whether it's in uh, the legal environment, you got all kinds of forces at work to suppress that kind of information, keep it quiet. Um, there's a woman who was reported on yesterday, I think, maybe it was Fox News that was reporting uh, that this woman is a bus driver and she's been told to pick up illegal immigrants from the border and take them into the country. And she takes them as far as Nashville and Atlanta and various places, but then somebody else takes them by bus all across the country. And so what we have is these illegal immigrants coming into the country and being uh, shipped all across the country 
Uh, oh, it was Tucker Carlson who was talking about this last night. Maybe you can pick up his discussion of it. And so you've got basically an attempt on the part of our government to undermine our country by bringing in an alien population. And they're trying to do it under the cover of night, but eventually somebody tries that. And this woman tried to speak out against it, and she was facing all kinds of resistance, you know, from legal people saying you can't say anything about this. And uh, so fighting it is going to be very, very, very difficult. All right, I'm going to close in prayer, and unless anybody has anything else to add or announcements, we'll finish up here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for our time together, and we thank you for your word and for the truths of your word. We pray that as we communicate these things to friends and family members and neighbors alike, that your spirit would bless these things. We know that it is uh, the battle is the Lord's, and so we need to trust you and your care for all that is to be done. We thank you that you are the Lord of the heavens and the earth, and the very rocks can be raised to... Uh, Praise the Lord Jesus, so we pray that you would grant us victory over evil in our world today. We thank you that the forces of creation are on our side, as well as the work of the Spirit and the angelic realm and the whole church. We do pray for your blessing on us, that Christ will be victorious and triumphant, that your word would go forth with great power, and that your purposes would be accomplished. And where we are called to suffer, we pray that you grant us strength and faithfulness to endure. We ask for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen.